When we come together, often what we hear as we come to a wedding, we hear the following words. We're assembled here in the presence of God to join this man and this woman in holy marriage, which is instituted of God, regulated by his commandments and blessed by our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us therefore reverently remember that God has established and sanctified marriage for the welfare and happiness of mankind. Marriage is a sacred institution, the basis of human society should be held in high honor among all men and women. Now that is not a particularly, or has not been in the past, a particularly controversial statement. It becomes controversial today because of what it, is, it affirms, that it is a holy institution ordained by God, that our understanding of marriage in our civilization comes from what is taught to us from Scripture, what is taught not only by the Old Testament Scriptures, by what Jesus said with regard to marriage. Today, it is, an, it is a disputed institution, and the things that I read here are actually under dispute. And as I wrote in a, a blog uh, several years ago, in a generation and a half, marriage has been redefined. It's def uh, marriage defined as a lifetime covenant between one man and one woman for the purpose of companionship, support, and procreation, and which recognizes sexual immorality, infidelity, or abandonment as grounds for divorce, it is fading from the common currency. Marriage is redefined today simply as an emotional connection between temporarily committed partners of any gender for any duration of time. That's really how marriage essentially has been redefined today. That's, that's a difficulty. It's a problem that we face. It's a problem that we face as Christians. When two, a couple comes together, we have vows that we take. Uh, some of the vows say this, I take you to have and to hold, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, sickness and in health, and forsaking all others, keep me only unto you. And the two people making the marriage vow here, better, richer, and health. <clears throat> well, it doesn't always work out exactly that way. Now, I'm recommending a few books to you uh, again. Tim Keller's book, The Meaning of Marriage. The uh, book by um, the First Things Ministry entitled The Two Shall Become One Flesh. And uh, also a, a secular book written by John Gottman called Why Marriages Succeed and Fail and How You Can Make Yours Last, where he addresses the whole issue of communication in marriage and how that is really a key for the health uh, and the effectiveness of a marriage. Now, we're going to read the two passages that address this, uh, two passages that address this in Scripture. There are many others. Let's look at uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verses um, 28 to 33. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own body. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is taken right from the book of Genesis. A man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound. And the Greek words are mystery and mega. It's a mega mystery. And I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Well, that's one passage, and Jesus actually quotes from this same passage in Genesis as well when he is questioned about the nature of marriage. And we can look at Matthew chapter 19, 3 through 6. He was challenged by the Pharisees about the teaching with regard to marriage, marriage, divorce, and remarriage. 
The Pharisees came and tested him by asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? And he answered. And notice now he goes back to this same passage. Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. So those two passages, one is quoted by Paul and one is quoted by Jesus in the book of Matthew. They go back to the very original created order. One of the first institutions, the first institution that God created for mankind is the institution of marriage, the institution of the family. And what we see is that marriage is a foundational institution for life, for the created order. God created three primary spheres according to scripture. One is the family, which is rooted in marriage. One is the church, which is the gathered worshiping community, the people of God, and we're called the bride of Christ. The third institution is the state. The state is, is an institution that was given by God. It was given after the fall. Its purpose is to restrain evil and to reward what is good, to protect those who do right and to punish those who do wrong. Another of its purposes is to make it possible for God's people to live in godliness and honesty. That is its purpose. But the very first institution that God created was the family. It was the marital relationship. It's the very first thing we're told in Genesis. And Jesus goes back to that institution when talking about the nature of the relationship between a man and his wife. In the beginning, this is how God created things to be. Now, God, Jesus was referring to a state that was not fallen, a state that was perfect, a state that did not uh, involve the sin of the man and the woman. After the fall, Moses uh, gave leave to the Israelites because of the hardness of heart to pursue a dissolution. But that was not what God intended. Jesus says God intended that the two should become one flesh. Not just intended, they do become one flesh. They are united together. And as I said last week, they are bonded together. They're bonded together as parts of a body. They're pasted together. There's a bond there. It's something that is welded together. And as I mentioned last week, uh, when Jane and I were married and the pastor was giving the uh, message, he kept emphasizing the fact that we were pasted together. And then when we went out to drive away to our honeymoon, which was only a few blocks away in a hotel where her two brothers worked, and we spent most of our time avoiding them, making sure that they didn't know that we were there. But anyway, the long and the short, it said, just paste it on the back of the car. And we were concerned that hopefully they, uh, people understood what that meant and didn't think that we were pasted in some other sense of the word. Anyway, there's a binding of these two people. And that means that to separate them is extremely painful. And that's what the scripture teaches. The separation of that marital relationship is painful. It is, it is difficult. It is, it is going to create difficulties and problems. And uh, we know that we live in a day and age where many people have faced these kinds of difficulties and are needing the grace of God for healing. But what Jesus said, the original purpose was that a man would be joined to his wife, the two should become one flesh. So marriage is a foundational institution. It predates, according to scripture, the state. It is not a creature of the state and therefore cannot be redefined by the state. God has defined marriage. Jesus Christ has defined marriage. Paul has defined marriage for us. The state does not have the authority or the power to redefine it, but it can attempt to do so. It doesn't change the natural law of God. The new public orthodoxy is donning the garb of official 
dogma. In the court case, the United States versus Windsor, which did away with the Defense of Marriage Act, Justice Anthony Kennedy surmised that legislators and advocates of the defense of marriage, which defines marriage for federal purposes of being a heterosexual institution, Kennedy said they're motivated by a bare desire to harm, to disparage or injure or humiliate. In fact, he concluded, such persons are essentially motivated by animus, those who hold to the beliefs that I'm declaring to you scripturally today. They're motivated by animus or ill will. And my statement is that, this is from a blog that I wrote several years back, it's only a short step from such a declaration by the highest court in the land to declaring advocates of traditional marriage enemies of the people. In fact, that process has begun. And in the first things uh, booklet that I mentioned to you, to stand for the biblical teaching of marriage, to uphold it, to, um, to support it, to declare it, will not be easy because the proponents of these alternative arrangements are very powerful. They do not hesitate to use the tools of calumny to defeat their opponents. And the time is approaching when Christians in this country will suffer abuse for upholding these truths that I'm declaring you today about marriage. We know that already to be true. That was two court cases ago. That was not the Obergefell case. That was the Windsor case that did away with the Federal Defense of Marriage Act. Things have continued to spiral in another direction. My point is this, marriage is a fundamental foundational institution and as followers of Christ, we adhere to his teaching. In the beginning, God created them male and female and for this cause a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave, shall be bonded to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. And I talked about the fact last week that they were naked and not ashamed and that there's a nature of the marriage relationship that is absolutely unique. There's a closeness. There is a vulnerability. There is an openness. There is an innocence, certainly in the garden, that is unlike any other institution. It's created by God. It can't be redesigned. It can't be remade. It is something created by God himself. And of course, again, as I said last week, that vulnerability that we are naked and not ashamed, we're completely open with our marriage partner. There really, there's this, this, this things that your partner knows about you and you know about him or her that no one else can know. That vulnerability can be dangerous. As I said, if you have goats, your partner knows where they're tied up and can always get them. So uh, there's no way to hide where those things are. Marriage is a foundational institution. Marriage is an exclusive commitment. A man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife. We take this vow, for better, for worse, rich or poor, sickness and health, Forsaking all others, I will keep me unto thee, so long as we both shall live. In other words, we're making a full-fledged commitment one to another that is intended to be permanent. And I, I understand the age in which we live. I understand the difficulties that we face. And I understand the difficulties that people in this room have faced in their life. But this is the intention that God has ordained, that it is an exclusive and a permanent commitment. It is one that involves becoming one flesh. It's a physical relationship. The physical relationship is powerful and it is part of the covenant that God has ordained that this physical relationship should be experienced within and only within the bounds of the covenant of marriage because that relationship is so powerful. It is exclusive. It's not to be shared with anyone else. And this includes, this includes uh, uh, seeking uh, fulfillment of physical and sexual appetites, not only outside the physical marriage relationship, but in the virtual world as well. 
This is a violation to seek the fulfillment of this desire in, in online or in the virtual world is a violation of the marriage covenant. It needs grace. It needs forgiveness. It needs cleansing. And it needs repentance. You see, we are told in the book of the Song of Solomon that marriage, the love between a man and a woman, is like a fire. Fire. It's a powerful, powerful um, analogy. If we look at Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verses 6 through 8, we quote this many times at weddings. This is talking about the marriage covenant. Set me as a seal on your heart, a seal upon your arm. This is significant of covenant, the man and the woman fully committed and devoted to one another. For love is as strong as death. Jealousy is as fierce as the grave. Its flashes are the flashes of fire. And this next phrase is very significant. The very flame of the word of the Lord. The word there is Hebrew. It is shalhevet, which means flame, yah. It's shalhevet yah, meaning Yahweh, short for the name, the Hebrew covenant name for God. It is God's flame. That's why Jesus says what God brings together, let not man separate. You see, in all the earth, this marriage covenant, it's, it's a covenant of nature. It's not just a Christian covenant. It's not just a covenant for people who believe. It's part of natural law. It's part of the natural order. And this marital relationship is the, is the covenant that's referred to here. It is the shalhevet yah. It is the flame of the Lord. There's something really almost divine about it. Now, here's the problem. We counterfeit this relationship today in the sexual revolution that has been going on for a couple of generations. It's counterfeited. We see it here. Paul warns about it, but it's not new today. It certainly existed in the times of the New Testament. I think the, the faith, as it has influenced Western civilization, has changed the practices and the habits but in Paul's time, uh, this certainly was an issue. We are told in Song of Solomon, many waters cannot quench love. Many floods cannot drown it. If a man offered for love all the wealth of his house, he would be utterly despised. But then we go on to the counterfeit, which we see in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 16 through 20. If we would pull up 1 Corinthians 6, 16 through 20. Here is what Paul tells the Christians of his day in a world very much like ours, which had a very different view of the nature of the physical relationship between the man and the wife. Do you not know that he was joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it is written, the two will become one flesh. For this, this physical unity even affects a non-marital relationship, he is saying. And he goes on to say, he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. You see, that's the picture that Paul has been painting. Husbands uh, and wives reflect the relationship between Christ and the church. When we become a Christian, when we devote our life to God, we are one spirit with him. It is a kind of marriage. And that's the analogy Paul is making. And then he goes on to say, flee from Sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. The sexually immoral person sins against his own body. And he goes on to say, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You are bought with a price. If you and I are followers of Jesus Christ, we need to understand we belong to him. We do not belong to ourselves. We are not free to pursue our own pleasures and desires. We are called to live our lives according to his standards and purposes. He says, glorify God in your body. And one of the means of doing this is observing and understanding what God teaches 
about this relationship. It is a foundational institution. It is an exclusive commitment. Now, Tim Keller writes in his book that I've mentioned to you that people view this, see this view of human uh, relationship, of human sexuality as, as unhealthy, as out of date, as something odd, wrong, weird, antiquated, and very foolish. But here's what Keller goes on to say in his book. The Bible does not counsel sexual abstinence before marriage because it has a low view of sex, but because it has such a lofty one. The biblical view imply, implies that sex out of marriage is not just morally wrong, but personally harmful. If this is the message that God has invented to create whole life entrustment and self-giving, it should not surprise us that this relationship makes us feel deeply connected to the other person, even when used wrongly. Unless you deliberately disable it, or through practice you numb the original impulse, sex makes you feel personally interwoven and joined to another human being as you are literally, physically joined. And even if you're not legally married, you may find yourself very quickly feeling marriage ties, feeling that the other person has obligations to you. But that other person has no legal, social, or moral responsibility even to call you back in the morning. This incongruity leads to jealousy and hurts feelings and obsessiveness. If two people are having this relationship but are not married, it makes breaking up vastly harder than it should be. It leads to many people to stay trapped in relationships that are not good because of a feeling of having somehow connected himself. Those are hard, blunt, straightforward truths that uh, Tim Keller declares. And I have to say, with regard to much premarital counseling that I've done over the, over the years, once that element enters into the relationship prior to marriage, it creates emotional entanglement that becomes um, very difficult at times. It can be very difficult for people to work through and to see their future clearly. Thirdly, not, secondly, marriage is not only an exclusive commitment, it's a heterosexual institution. A man shall leave his father and his mother and shall cleave to his wife. Augustine, the great saint, told us that the intentions of marriage are fidelity. That is faithfulness to your partner. Permanence. It is a full-fledged and permanent commitment. And finally, that one of its primary purposes is procreation. Fourthly, as I've already said, marriage is a disputed institution. It is intended for blessing. It is tended to be celebrated. It's intended for companionship, support, and procreation. But it is dis disputed. And alternative arrangements have been created. Easy divorce, cohabitation, and same-sex marriage are very common today. This is how our society does relationships uh, that are considered to be marriage relationships in nature. However, as we're told uh, by Meg Jay, this is some years back in the New York Times with regard to cohabitation. Couples who cohabit before marriage and especially before an engagement or otherwise clear commitment tend to be less satisfied with it. This is not a Christian view, by the way. This is a sociologist at the University of Virginia writing. Couples who cohabit before marriage and especially before engagement and otherwise clear commitment tend to be less satisfied with their marriages and more likely to divorce than couples who do not. These negative outcomes are called the cohabitation effect. 
Women are more likely to view cohabitation as a step toward marriage, while men are more likely to see it as a way to test the relationship or to postpone commitment. This gender asymmetry, according to Jay, is associated with negative interactions and lower levels of commitment even after the relationship progresses to marriage. Now, I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news. And you guys are just as dead serious as anybody I've ever seen <laughs> in my life. I mean, you are scary the way you are looking at me. But I'm just telling you the truth, all right? Now, God does not want us to see the physical relationship or the marital relationship as a negative thing. He wants us to see it in the most positive terms possible. He wants us to see it in terms of celebration and thanksgiving. He wants us to see it as a great gift and he wants us to protect it. And this is why he has given us these guidelines. The other thing is this. We all fail in many things. And even if you've kept all of these rules, you may be finding yourself wanting in your marital relationship. You have, may have found it very difficult and you may have suffered abandonment or infidelity. You may have been guilty of these things. God is a God of grace. God is a God of life. God is a God of healing, but he gives us a divine order for a purpose because he knows what's best for us and what we must do is submit ourselves to the revelation that he gives us so we can understand what he wants for us for our best. Someone says, well, you know, I don't know if I married the right person. Well, that person is the right person now, my friend. <laughs> As, they, as I said last week, I went into, uh, as a, I went into in, in my wife's house, her parents' house, a little sign on the wall of the bathroom, as we said, all the important words of wisdom are on the bathroom wall. It says, keep your eyes wide open before marriage and half closed afterwards. That's very good advice once you have come together you are trusting God to help you to fulfill these incredible vows that you've made and God has given Jane and I great grace for 38 years it's at 30 37 almost so she can't remember either I'm not in trouble it's 38 coming up takes grace, takes great grace, takes more grace for her than it does for me, I'm sure. Great grace and help with failures and confidence that God will never leave us nor forsake us. And if we have experienced difficulty or hardship or you have experienced failure in this area of your life, I want you to know that is one of the most painful things that a person can experience. I know that. I know that to be true. And God's grace is sufficient for you. He is there to help you. That doesn't change the fact that his design and his order is with our best interest in mind. Marriage is a disputed institution. It is a divine institution. Uh, Honor the marriage bed undefiled. Marriage is honorable in all, we are told. It is not just for Christians. It's for all people. It is a divine institution. And it is a relationship that reflects the relationship between Christ and the church. We are members of his body, and husbands and wives are members one of another. Your health is affected by your spouse's health. Their well-being affects your well-being. That's why Paul says, husbands, love your wives. Because if you love your wife, you're loving yourself. Because that returns to you as a blessing. 
Now, there are some myths of marriage. Here's one that I think comes from Les and Leslie's Parrot, Parrot's book, How to Save Your Marriage Before It Starts. When we go into marriage, we expect, we believe that we're expecting the same things from marriage. That's usually not true. You figure that out as time goes on. We believe that automatically everything good in our marriage will automatically get better. It takes work, it takes effort, it takes prayer, and it takes commitment. Well, we somehow believe as we enter marriage that everything bad in my life will disappear when I get married. I got news for you, that's not true. And the fourth one is that my spouse will make me whole. If you're looking for your spouse to make, your spouse is a blessing. Your spouse is a wonderful thing. But your spouse does not make you whole. Only God in Jesus Christ can make you whole. You must find your fulfillment in him. Do you remember the story of the woman at the well? She'd had five husbands and was living with the sixth. And I believe that she was a person who found, trying to find fulfillment in her relationships. And she had asked Jesus for water and Jesus spoke to the need of her heart. You know what? You're looking for water, not for your physical thirst. You're looking for water for the thirst of your soul. I've got news for you. There's only one place to get the water that will meet the thirst of your soul. I have it, says the Lord. He who drinks of the water that I give him will never thirst again. Your fulfillment comes from God alone. I love Sarah Grove's song. I am now performing. She's a performer, a Christian performer. I perform for an audience of one. This is ultimately where your fulfillment comes from. And as you find fulfillment in Christ, you can give yourself to become a fulfillment and a blessing to your spouse, to your husband and wife. And yes, you can bring fulfillment to them, but you are not their ultimate fulfillment. Only God can be that. If, if you struggle, if you have failed, it is the grace of God that will bring wholeness to your life personally and to your relationship and to your household. Christ only is the means of satisfying your soul. God says, I will give you water to drink that whoever drinks it will never grow thirsty again. He says, that hunger in your heart, I am the bread of life. I can fill that need that no person, no spouse can fill. I am the bread of life. And once you settle that, you become free, not to find your spouse as the one who fulfills you, but the one to whom you give that you may be in some sense of fulfillment to them. And then that will come back to you because that's a universal law. Give and it shall come back to you. Give and it shall be given unto you. Now in, in closing, I have 10 pieces of advice for marriageable people, which excludes the vast majority of you, but includes a few of you. And it goes like this. Here are some questions you should ask yourself if you're thinking about pursuing marriage. I share this with classes uh, in different parts of the world, mostly young people, but it could be people of all ages. Here are some questions you should ask if you're thinking about marriage. Is this relationship leading me closer to or farther away from God? Is it causing me to compromise my convictions? That's an important question. Another question you might want to, no, you might want to, you should ask, you have to ask, are we spiritually compatible? There's no spiritual compatibility in the most important issue in your life, which is your faith. That's an issue. That's a problem. Is this relationship based on physical or emotional attraction alone? On the other hand, are we physically and emotionally attracted to each other? 
I remember a young man coming to me and saying, you know, I think uh, I should marry such and such a person. I feel like maybe God spoke this to me. I said, well, let me ask you a question. Are you attracted to her? He said, oh, no. <laughs> I said, I tell you what, you better go back and start over. <laughs> this does not make any sense. Do I have the means to support a marriage and future family at this time? Is pursuing a marital relationship realistic? How do those close to me feel about and see this relationship? Sometimes your friends, your family members see things you don't see. They say love is blind. It's very true. How do my spiritual leaders view this relationship? I think that's significant. It's important. Here's a real important one. It was important for Jane and I because we're both from very large families, uh, seven brothers and sisters each, eight in each family. Do I get along with, appreciate, like his or her extended family? Boy, that's an important question. You know you marry the whole family. You knew that, didn't you? Okay, that's important to realize. As believers in Christ, we should not marry one who does not share our faith. That's not discrimination. That's recognizing that this is something you have to share with someone if you're going to be compatible. And number 10, pray and seek God's guidance, but do not over-spiritualize. Some people are looking for a sign in the clouds usually doesn't work that way. I had one student who was talking to me about being married and he said, uh, you know, I really, this was in the Croatia actually, he said, uh, I really like this uh, person. I think we should get married. What do you think? And so I went through my 10, my list of 10 uh, ideas here, which I think are very good. He just looked at me and said, Professor, it's not that complicated. We just like each other a whole lot. Well, they got married and they're doing great 20 years later. And uh, sometimes we can complicate this whole thing. And at the root, we just like each other a whole lot. It's really, really important, isn't it? Can anyone say amen? amen? Are you still out there? I want to pray, and then I want to ask the worship team to come. Let's take a moment. Lord, we know that marriage is a divine institution. It's a contested institution. And when we take vows, we think of richer and better and health Sometimes hard things come into our relationship, come into our lives. I pray for the marriages represented here, that that commitment that has been made will hold steady through hard things and difficult passages in life. And I pray that we'll understand that this physical relationship that you give us, that we place within the fireplace, I pray that it would be one that we understand is created for our good and is to be celebrated, but is also entirely sacred. I pray for each marriage here. I pray for each single person here. And I pray, Lord, that each single person would understand that you have blessed the single life, that you are the fulfillment of each person. And you give each one their gift, one after this and one after that manner. And Father, I just pray for the marriages present here, or those that may come into being in the future, that you would let your grace rest upon your people in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.